here this morning and great to worship with you guys. Uh, now, one of the things that I find most interesting to learn about and study on the planet is the why behind the behaviors that we all do. Sometimes I look at my own life and I'm trying to analyze, maybe overanalyze what, I, what I've got going on or why I'm doing the things that I'm doing. But I love learning this, the, the why behind anybody, why they do what they do. Um, I, I remember uh, during the pandemic when all the sports were shut down, there was a documentary that started airing called The Last Dance, uh, documentary doc, telling all the stories about Michael Jordan and the run of the Bulls through the 90s. And uh, it didn't just tell the what of the story of their great success that they had, but it talked a lot about the why behind Michael Jordan and his like just crazy, absurd competitiveness that, that he had throughout his whole life. And got into his childhood and he had an older brother, Larry. And so he'd like battle against him. And then he got cut from his middle school team. So that drove him even harder. And then by the end of his career, he, he had to have that competitive edge. So he literally started making up stories about the people he was playing and things they had said that wasn't even true, but he would start like literally believing it so he could have that competitive edge. And it's probably why he became arguably the, the greatest athlete of all time. But sometimes for me, I look at my own children and I say, why? <laughs> not, not why did God give them to me? I think, why do you do the things that you do? Like, I, I, you know, so, so my son, he's nine years old. And uh, recently he comes to my wife and he says, you know, hey, um, could I have the, uh, those like tong thingies that dad uses for the grill? And uh, Sarah's like, yeah, they're over here on the kitchen counter, blah, blah, blah. She's like, wait, why do you need those? <laughs> like, you're not supposed to be playing with the grill. So why? And he's like, well, you know. And she's like, no, why don't you uh, share your why there, son? And uh, he's like, well, you know, I, uh, I ate my banana and I had the peel left over and I was doing a little fadeaway in the bathroom. And uh, turns out it came up a little short and it's sitting in the toilet right now. She's like, so son, you thought that the solution to this problem was to be to grab a utensil that we use to grab our food off of the grill out of our dirty toilet. He's like, oh yeah, good point, good point. Um, so she said, you need to figure this out yourself. And thankfully he did. He grabbed some like pencils and like kind of pulled them out and then threw the whole thing away. But you know, I'm, I'm left asking this question daily to my children. Why, why would you do that? Like what, what made you think that was a good idea? I still have yet to come up with a good answer from them. But I'm fascinated by the why that happens in our world, why we do what we do. And I'm also interested in why God does what he does. And that's the question that we're going to be asking today is, what is God's motivation? What motivates God? What's his why? Why does he do what he does? Or, or why doesn't he do certain things when, when we want him to do certain things? And that's the question that we're going to be looking at. And uh, as a church, we've been going through the book of Matthew. And so today we're going to pick up with a miracle story from Jesus. Um, this is found in Matthew chapter 15. You can open up your Bibles or we'll have it here on the screen as we ask this question, what is God's motivation? Jesus left there and went along the Sea of Galilee. Then he went up on a mountainside and sat down. Great crowds came to him, bringing the lame, the blind, the crippled, the mute, and many others, and laid them at his feet. And he healed them. The people were amazed when they saw the mute speaking, the crippled made well, the lame walking, and the blind seeing, and they praised the God of Israel. Jesus called his disciples to him and said, I have compassion for these people. They have already been with me three days and have nothing to eat. I do not want to send them away hungry, or they may collapse on the way. His disciples answered, Where can we get enough bread in this remote place to feed such a crowd? How many loaves do you have? Jesus asked. Seven, they replied, and a few small fish. He told the crowd to sit down on the ground. Then he took the seven loaves and the fish, and when he had given thanks, he broke them and gave them to the disciples, and they in turn to the people. They all ate and were satisfied. Afterward, the disciples picked up seven basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. The number of those who ate was 4,000 men, not including the women and children. After Jesus had sent the crowd away, he got into the boat and went to the vicinity of Magadan. 
So there's several possible takeaways that we can see just, just right away in this story. And, and the first is that Jesus is not just some ordinary man. He's not just even some ordinary prophet. He does a miracle, feeding 4,000 people out of seven little fish and a couple little things of bread. Like he is showing his divine nature, that he's fully man, fully God, come down to this earth. Like he is not just an ordinary person. Or you, you might recognize right away that it's like, oh man, this is a story of just Jesus's provision. Like he's a God who provides. And, and you see these things right away in the text. But I think there's actually more here that we can learn and dissect from this story. Now, Jesus uh, walking into this situation, I think he's, he's in an interesting predic predicament here. So uh, he's, he's in a situation where, hey, he's been doing all this ministry for three days to thousands of people. Like he's healing people. Like there's, there's miracle upon miracle that are happening. And, you know, he's, he's working really hard. And they get to the end of these three days and he's recognizing like, hmm, these, these people are hungry. I don't, I don't want them on their way home to, to collapse and fall over and faint like of, of hunger. And, but you know, it's, it's interesting. If you think back to before Jesus started his public ministry, back in Matthew chapter four, we, we talked about this several months ago because we've been going through the book of Matthew. Jesus was in the desert and he was being tempted like crazy by the enemy of God saying like, you could have all the kingdoms of this world and, and all, everything you ever wanted. And for 40 days and for 40 nights, Jesus goes without any food. And it could have been that in this situation, Jesus could have responded and said, you know, I've been the one who's been up here doing all the work. Y'all have been out here just getting the blessings. Not only that, I've done this for 40 days. Like I've 13 X'd y'all out here on, you know, you've done three days. I've done 40 out here. And he, he could have responded in that way and been like, you know, you're kind of weak sauce, honestly. <laughs> But Jesus doesn't respond that way. Instead, what the text says is he had compassion for them. Not only that, think about the disciples. Okay, I don't know if you remember this. Uh, Pastor Bob referenced this uh, either last week or the week before, just quickly. But literally in the chapter before this one, there's a story. And it tells the story of how there was people who were hungry. And they needed, all that they had was like a little bit of bread and a little bit of fish. And Jesus turns that and feeds 5,000 men plus the women and the children. So literally not long before, Jesus has done this basically exact same miracle to even more people. And so Jesus, part of his mission was to come and to train these disciples, say like, I'm going to build the church on your shoulders. He's trying to train them up, raise them up to become more like him and explain what the kingdom of God looks like. Jesus could have taken this moment and been like, seriously? Like, you see, we've got a little food. We've got a little bread. I even have the exact same meal sitting over here. And the disciples don't even think to ask, Jesus, could you perform a miracle again like you've done before? You know, Jesus could have responded in a very, very different way, either to the crowd or to his closest friends. But instead, as we see in verse number 32, it says, Jesus, I have compassion for these people. He didn't want them to be hungry. He, he didn't want them to go without. And I will tell you this, sometimes for us here today, we look at our own humanity. We look at our own inadequacies. We look at our own places of weakness, places where we're hungry, places where we're, we don't feel like we have enough. Sometimes we can even take it in our minds to think like I am less than, or maybe even I am sinful because I'm, I'm not quite enough. But Jesus sees the sickness and the pain and the hurting and the place that he starts is a place of compassion. And it wasn't just for the people that were experiencing him here on earth back 2000 years ago. It's the same heart that Jesus has for you and for me. Jesus's motivation towards us is compassion. And that, my friends, is really, really good news because we really, really need this in our lives. Like I think about it, like if you're in that conflict at work, Jesus starts with compassion towards you. If you're in a place where you're looking for work, Jesus starts with compassion towards you. If you're in a spot where you continue to mess up and fail over and over again, you have to know that the heart of God 
where he starts towards you is not a place of looking at you in judgment and disgust. The place he starts towards you is compassion. Now, maybe you're like me and, and you read these things or you hear these things and you're like, yeah, okay, I see that very clearly in the text. Like Jesus is very compassionate. He could have responded very differently. But I don't know about you, Jonathan. Have you ever read the Old Testament? Because that God sure looks a lot different than the God of the New Testament. Like the Old Testament God looks angry. He doesn't sound compassionate at all. He's, he's raining down fire on these people. What do you have to say about that? Well, I'll tell you first off that the Bible is the most fascinating piece of literature, books that I've ever experienced in my life. Like it, it, it has changed my life more than anything ever has. But I, I think that what's interesting about the Bible is it's so accessible and so, uh, yeah, so easy to understand in some levels that a toddler can understand it. So we have our toddlers and, and kids all learning about that right now in a really important ministry happening down those hallways. Yet the Bible is so complex that we can spend our whole lives studying it and still continue to learn thing and thing again and continue to have our ch hearts changed by it. And, and I think that that's really fascinating about the scriptures. So even understanding the complexities of the Old Testament versus the New Testament, like there, it, it can take a while to fully unpack that. And so I'm not going to be able to fully answer that question of is the God of the Old Testament and the New Testament? I can't fully unpack every Old Testament story today, unless you guys want to stay here for like 75 hours. And, but I'm not Jesus, so I can't do three days <laughs> straight. But um, instead, I do want to look at some, uh, some pictures in Scripture, some stories that uh, God gives to us to kind of unpack this today. So uh, let's look at the life of Moses. Here's, here's a famous person in history. He is a guy who leads people out of slavery, uh, the Israelites out in the book of Exodus. And these people he was leading, they were a handful. Like they struggled with doubt. They struggled with disobedience. They were ungrateful. They whined to him like all the time. And so this, this poor leader, like he's been through it. He, he's, he's seen his people sitting in slavery. Like he's gone through really hard times. And it could be really easy for him to react and say, uh, like, this is what God is like. Like he is just this horrible God who does not care and is just too slow to act. And listen to the words of Moses in Deuteronomy chapter 1. And in the wilderness, where you have seen how the Lord your God carried you, as a man carries his son, all the way that you went until you came to this place. You see, a father carries his son with care and with gentleness and with patience, even when that, that son can't really do anything or, you know, in return for the father. Just like a, a caring father cares for their son, that is how Moses describes how God is towards us. He carries us. He loves us. He is patient with us. That is how Moses describes the character of God. Now, David, another story. Here's another person who lives a, a thousand years before Jesus, and he is a real rags to riches, a started from the bottom, now he's here kind of a guy. Like, like he's somebody who uh, starts as a lowly shepherd, kind of like the lowest ranking person, and he climbs all the way up to king. Uh, he, he's got this, and, and even in his life, he's got these amazing triumphs of like being amazingly faithful to God, and then some of the biggest failures you could, you could ever imagine. And David's somebody who experienced both the compassion of God, but he also experienced the justice of God. Uh, he got held accountable for some of his huge mistakes that he made. And let's listen to how David describes what the character of God is like. As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. David cites once again the character of God in the Old Testament as being compassionate. 
Okay, last one, the prophet Isaiah. Now the prophet Isaiah, this man, if he were here today, would just be like straight fire emojis all over your social media. Like this man, he would bring the fire and he, he talked a lot about the judgment of God that, that's coming. And he would talk about like, your sin is gonna lead you into destruction. And he was trying to help like guide them out of that and be like, there's a better way. Like God has a better way for you. And, uh, but people kept falling into sin again, worshiping the wrong gods, like putting other things before Yahweh and, and it just over and over and over again. And so again, here's somebody who is a prophet who warned of the judgment of God. And let's listen to how Isaiah talks about God's heart for the Lord has comforted his people and will have compassion on his afflicted. You see, the compassion that we see in Jesus when he performs a miracle for people who are hungry and trying to learn and grow their faith is the same character of the God of the Old Testament. The, the character of God is consistent throughout all the ages. It does not change. But here is what's really interesting is that the character of who God is, is God is the perfect fulfillment of both virtues, justice and and compassion. He's fully both. And, and I will admit, I don't always get this or understand this or, or know how to unpack this on every single story in scripture because I'm not God. <laughs> I know that's write that down. Um, you're, you're really surprised right now at that, but I, I don't understand all the complexities that there are to that, but I do know and trust that who God is has been consistent over and over and over again. And that same God, the same character of God in the Old Testament, the same character of God is revealed to us through Christ Jesus is the same God that we have, that we have access to here and now today through the power of the Holy Spirit. And the heart of God towards us has, has always been compassion. But the heart of God has also been a heart that cares about people being held accountable and cares about the oppressed and cares about the weak and cares about the poor and cares about like he, he all through scripture, it lists this over and over and over again. But the good news for you and for me is that even with our seemingly laundry list of mistakes that we have, Jesus has compassion for you and for me. And that is good news. If you believe it, would you say amen? Amen. amen. Now, one of the goals for those of us who call ourselves followers of Jesus in the room, one of our goals is to become more and more like Jesus. The, uh, the, uh, the Apostle Paul, he writes this after uh, Jesus has uh, died, uh, resurrected again, come back to life. Uh, he, he writes this in a letter to the church in Philippi. He says, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. Or the disciple John, he writes a very similar message when he says, whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he, Jesus, walked. You see, as we become more like Jesus, our call is to become more compassionate. That's part of the invitation that God has for us is to become more and more like him. But I don't know about you, but sometimes in my life, I don't always feel like I'm growing in compassion perfectly. Like sometimes for me, the first thing that happens in my mind is judgment. Anybody else been there? You don't have to show your hands. <laughs> but I know that, and, and here's the thing, maybe you're sitting there thinking like, yeah, I do that. But you know what, pastor, usually when I judge, I'm usually right. <laughs> And I'm, I'm not even arguing with you whether you're right or whether you're wrong. And God obviously calls us to use discernment, but there's a difference between discernment and judgment. And, and we know the difference uh, when, we're, when we are there in that space. But I will tell you, how, how can you actually grow compassion in your heart? Well, let me tell you first, the way you don't grow compassion in your heart is you try to just look at somebody else you know who's like really, really, really compassionate and be like, I'm going to be like them. Maybe you're even thinking of somebody right now. Like I have somebody literally in my brain right now that I'm like, yeah, she is so compassionate, like consistent every single time, way better than me at it. And here's what I'll tell you is when you try to look at someone else and be like, yeah, I, gotta, I just got to try harder and be more like them. 
what inevitably ends up happening is you end up failing. You end up doing worse than them. And so when you, when you try to compare yourself to somebody else, then you're like, man, I'm never going to be as good as them. And then you get in this spiral in your head where you just, you, and, and then what that spiral turns into is shame. And then shame never leads you to become more like Jesus. It never does. Guilt, conviction, repentance, that leads you to be more like Jesus. But when you just turn your eyes and you try to look at somebody else who's like better at you than something and just try to be like them, it doesn't usually work out for you. But I will tell you that the way you can actually grow in compassion is to turn your eyes towards Jesus. And the way that we do this, even when we're reading and studying scripture like this, is we, we read a passage, we read a miracle story of Jesus taking loaves and fish and, and providing for 4,000 plus people. And we don't read into this story that we are like Jesus, like we are the compassionate one and we are the savior. We look at the passage like this and we recognize that we are the ones who were sick and who were broken and who need healed, and who were blind and couldn't really see all that there was to really see in this world. Like when we see ourselves as that, that's when we start to really grow in compassion. Because what happens when we start to read ourselves as, as the weak and the vulnerable and the, the people in need is we humble ourselves. And humility is the key that unlocks compassion for you and for me. Compassion always starts with humility, recognizing I don't deserve the compassion I've actually been given by God over and over and over again. And when we start to recognize that, that's when we start to see, man, God, I don't, I don't deserve this, but you continue to pour out that compassion on me. And God, I'm so grateful for that. And then what ends up happening is compassion starts to flow outside of us because our hearts are humble and grateful for the compassion that we have received. Amen? Amen. I'm going to actually invite the worship team out right now, but I want to tell you a story. I was, uh, I, I had, uh, I had this moment, this is a couple years ago, um, I'm on Facebook, and somebody's posting something, and I'm just getting like really irritated. Ever happened to you? <laughs> So, so I did what I recommend for everybody to do, hit the old mute button, like just need to pause that for a little bit out here. But uh, the, the person who was posting, they were a Christian, and the, the things that they were posting, I thought were not just like unchristian, that, but they were untrue. And so I was annoyed, honestly, at them. And I, I remember like, okay, I'll just kind of leave that be, but it was still like kind of sitting in my brain for a couple of days where it just was coloring my view of them. And uh, I, I was reading a, a quick scripture. I opened up my Bible app right before bed. I was going to literally spend like three minutes with God. And um, I pull it up and I'm reading from Matthew chapter five, where Jesus says, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. And it dawned on me that I had begun to make this person, who's another brother in Christ, an enemy of my heart. I just was frustrated with them, but it was, it was actually growing. And I will say, like, God convicted me in that moment. Not that I was wrong. I didn't actually change any of my convictions. I still think what that person posted was unchristian and untrue. And they're more of a peripheral friend. So it wasn't like somebody I could even like, I felt like I could call out or have a conversation with. Like they literally live out of state. Like, and so I just was sitting there and I was like, hmm, all right, maybe I need to pray for this person. And it was interesting as I did that, I, I, I felt like, man, I, maybe I need to pray for this person a little more regularly. And so I, I started doing that. I probably did it for about a week. And it was interesting because what I noticed is that, again, my convictions didn't change, but my heart changed towards that person. God began to, to shape my heart and say like, Jonathan, do you know all the experiences that, that they've had? Do you know all the voices they're inputting that have shaped their mind to say something like this? What if God could actually help shape their heart to become more like Jesus? 
And what was interesting is I noticed my heart that had become cold towards this person, the, the prayers that started to come out of my time with God started to be for that person. And it was, it was totally different. And this is how God is with us. Like we've made so many mistakes, sinned against him so many times, and yet his heart is towards us. It is for us. That, that is amazing that the God of the universe has so much compassion for you and for me that he would send his only son to die in our place. He loved us that much. So this morning, I wanna invite you to have compassion grow in your heart. So we're not gonna to compare to the, to the other people in this room, but we're gonna turn our eyes towards Jesus. So I wanna invite you to, to bow your heads, close your eyes, to try to drown out distraction here for just a moment. And I want you to think about this question. Who is it that you really struggle to show compassion towards? Maybe it's an individual, maybe it's a group of people, Maybe it's the, the overly religious folks, they drive you crazy. Or maybe it's the people who are overtly sinful and you're worried about where they are leading our culture or our world. Or maybe it's somebody who's on the opposite side of the political aisle as you. Maybe it's somebody that uh, you're just in perpetual conflict with. Maybe it's at work. Maybe it's even your spouse and it's been building up with frustration for years or towards your children. Or maybe it's even this morning that you're frustrated with yourself. I don't know where God wants to grow your compassion this morning, but I believe he wants to do that. So I'm gonna give you a moment to be able to listen and to talk to him and to ask God to grow compassion inside your heart. So Lord, this morning, would you help us to give ourselves compassion? And then Lord, would it, from an outflowing of that, would you help us to be able to be compassionate towards other people? Would you help us to humble our hearts, to recognize our own need that is so deep? God, would you shape us and mold us to be more like you? Would you soften the, the places in our hearts that have become calloused towards other people? Would you help us to be a light to a world that needs you so, so desperately? Would you help us to be a people who was so passionate about being compassionate that we could, we could be used by you in some amazing ways not so that we're receiving some kind of glory, but that we can make much of you. Allow the compassion we've received to flow out of our hearts this morning, Jesus. We say that we love you because you have loved us first. And all who agree with that prayer said amen. Amen. I'm going to invite you to stand and sing. We're going to sing about the goodness of God and turn our eyes heavenward as we continue to become more like Jesus. Jesus.